Hello everyone, I hope you're all doing very well. Today we've got to something a little bit different. We usually interview ground crew in aviation and sometimes pilots. Uh, probably best if I read the synopsis out first of all and then you'll understand where we're going. Hello, I hope your day is going well. My name is Aaron, or Rainer as we're going to say. Hello Rainer, thank you for coming. I'm uh, happy to be here. And would like to volunteer my military and air defence experience. Brackets, not sure if I am interesting enough for an interview. Close brackets to the Grim Reapers. My first enlistment was as a forward observer slash JTAC for the US Army, trained by the US Air Force forward air controllers. Experience with, <laughs> I love this, piss off, great, precision munitions and targeting software, smart munitions, Excalibur rounds, GLID, LLDR, laser designation, combat forensics and air assault experience working with the american f-16 and british tornadoes during joint cast exercises now as soon as i read that immediately i thought yep gotta have him on uh, second enlistment in the u.s army i was a patriot battery commander post team leader communications acronym which is non-commissioned officer in charge in the engagement control center patriot interceptor inspector and acronym data link operations specialist Brackets intended Air Force security briefings during the testing of the Chinese K-20, which was later named the J-20. Oh, yeah, we recently did a video on that interesting piece of equipment. Operated yes. and contained extensive information on various U USAD systems and Patriot base interceptors, Avenger SAM systems and Sentinel portable air defense radars. I also participated in soldier exchange programs with the Japanese Self-Defense Force, embedded with the air defense systems and rapid response fighter wing for three months. So there's quite a resume, which is awesome. Out of interest, we did have a, 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 pat a Patriot guy on before, and I forget exactly what his post was, but um, we found that really interesting going through that. I'll see. I've been through um, mostly Fort Sill, Oklahoma, and then... On Okinawa, I was on Kadena Air Base, and then from mm -hmm. Kadena Air Base, uh, a couple other different places, messed around on Navy agents, and there was even a um, live fire event over on Kwajalein Atoll in the same area. The Patriot's a very small world in the military, usually. Yeah, Roger. Yeah, you might even know this guy, but okay. Very good. What we usually do, uh, as you, I'm sure you know, is we just allow the viewers to ask questions. Sometimes they're stupid. Sometimes they're really clever. That's just how it goes. Anything before we go to, go to the questions? Uh, no. Uh, if there's anything that I can't talk about or is still relevant, obviously, I'll let you guys know. Um, I'll try to get as close as possible. Some of these are, are, are pretty answerable, so cool. I don't think I have any problems. Super. So, number one, do you think it is possible, or do you know of, an aircraft shooting down a Patriot missile using commonly carried aircraft air-to-air -air missiles? This is from Foxbat93. Someone apparently ever shot down a Patriot. I can't imagine so, but... This was a very interesting question to me. So, I, I suppose now, from what I understand, there are some Russian air-to-air -air missiles that are uh, superseding aerodynamic maneuvering capability, as in they're using uh, maneuvering thrusters of some mm -hmm, sort. Yeah. So, in theory, that might have the capability to maneuver onto an interceptor, um, especially with the difference in Patriot interceptors. You have Pack 2 which is a little bit larger, and Pack 3s which are a bit smaller. Uh, 2 would be much easier to engage. However, it would come down to the fact that the Patriot interceptor is leaving the launcher at about Mach 1, and it's designed to do a head-on intercept. So, you've got plane coming Mach 3, interceptor coming Mach 3, the plane wanting to hit that Patriot interceptor is going to have to be able to see it, track it, engage it, and all those things. And the pilot and the systems have got to be on point. And I just, I think it might be possible with some of the modern systems out there, but the capability of the pilot and the systems to, to see it in time, I just don't know. Patriot's a very, very fast system. Roger, we've tried, just for fun, we've tried intercepting in DCS fast things. Like we've, we've done the equivalent of, or as close as we to get to, like an SR-71, trying to just shoot down an SR-71. We actually used a, um, a B-1 or something like that. Like, it's a really hard thing to do. You think it's easy. Big aeroplane coming towards you. You have to think. The problem is you have to think so far in advance. You have to think well, kind of five minutes in advance. It's a very hard thing to do. Patriot radars are massive things with tons of power put into them. They can, they can analyze something at a very small level. But uh, air, airplane radars are they're limited by size capacity. So their ability to, to see that missile and to be monitoring the area it's going to come from in time is it's very minute. I suppose in a perfect scenario, um, some of these modern air-to-air -air missiles might be capable of maneuvering onto it, but it would have to be absolutely perfect. 
Moja, I think the late the latter of the AIM-54 Phoenixes was an anti-missile missile, but we're talking about presumably anti-ship missiles that would be shooting down, which is generally speaking pretty slow. Big, slow things, not not going to move maneuver particularly fast. Whereas your Patriot is, you know, a high kinematic weapon. But. Yes, the uh, cruise missiles actually the anti. Uh, ship stuff are they're, they're a very interesting challenge for some patriot systems for their capabilities to like maneuver into terrain canyons that kind of thing they are they're very slow but they're quite clever so those are always challenging cool okay very good uh let's move on to the next one number two do the missiles have any weaknesses i'm assuming we're talking about the patriot have any weaknesses that could be exploited by aircraft to avoid getting hit and what are the best countermeasure against them so before you say i guess you better sp- Talk about exactly which kind of pack we're talking about here. So uh, most of the time we're pack two, pack three. Uh, we have certain types of page interceptors that are going to be geared more towards engaging missiles. And then we have ones that are going to be geared towards more towards things like airplanes, helicopters. Um, so against an airplane, it would be a larger pack two. The problem, I suppose, with dodging, uh, you're, number one, if it comes to an actual like physical dodge, it will never, never, ever, 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 ever happen. I've uh, been over this so many times, giving briefs to um, Air Force officers to come at Patriot sites. Number one question, can the F-22, no, it can't. It doesn't matter what the airframe is. If that Patriot radar can see you, if that interceptor's in the air, it's going to get you. There is no way any airframe can dodge the Patriot interceptor. It's just not possible. Now, um, as with any modern SAM system of that nature, your, your problem's the radar. Not necessarily the interceptor. Um, so if you can stop the radar, um, that, that's going to be your key. But the interceptor itself is a scary, high maneuverable piece of work that uh, is going to come so fast, the reaction time's just not there. And it's some of the capabilities I've seen in testing is we were, um, this is this is older footage, so this is open source, but uh, some of the Raytheon test footage, they're showing an F-16 approaching at uh, 1.5 Mach with a dummy in the cockpit and they were able to put early model Patriot pack one interceptors on the face hmm. of the dummy at an approach speed, uh, near Mach six. Wow. So they are, they're, they're incredibly capable. Once again, it's the radar is going to be your, your problem. The Patriot pack interceptors are amazing, but, uh, the radar, that's, that's, that's the only way you're going to dodge anything. If it's in the air, just check. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just check. absolutely. So there's not really much you can do other than putting a mountain between you and it. Or exactly. Not being now, if, there. if you break that, um, most modern SAM systems, uh, Patriot, I'm, I'm sure it's not exclusive in this, but they're going to have some sort of system that if the lock is lost, uh, the, the, the interceptor is probably going to self detonate or whatnot. You can't have missiles with warheads flying around willy nilly. Same with the AMRAMs and any other weapon system like that. If guidance is lost, then the weapon will detonate to avoid something like flying into a building and mm-hmm. exploding. Break the lock, and uh, for, for just long enough for that interceptor to think that it doesn't have it anymore, you might dodge it, but there will be another coming. <laughs> yeah. Okay, very good. Uh, number three, are allies hiding the true capabilities of the missiles to fool the Russians, so to speak? I would say that, you know, everybody's doing that to, to some extent, even within our own uh, intercompeting contractors. Within air defense, we have a number of competing contractors. We have Tim Hanna, we have Raytheon, and uh, they're competing for each other's jobs every once in a while. So all the cards aren't always on the table. Uh, we do a lot of live fire exercises in the Pacific, at least once a year usually, which is we'll engage a drone or something like that with a, a live missile launch. The interceptors we use, though, and part of this is a little bit of show of force, and this is what we have. We have Patriot over here. Those are very old interceptors. Um, that we're using for those engagements. They are still incredibly capable. In the Pacific theater, it's a constant game uh, between China and America about showing each other's cards. And they will do things to try and get us to react to them just so they can see what our capabilities are. And we do the same to them. Um, Sometimes we'll let them um, bring surveillance vessels right around the area. There's not much we could do about it. But um, we can be very clever, and they'll put out notices like, hey, guys, Chinese are listening on your phones. Don't talk about stuff. So we'll get on our cell phones, and we will <laughs> call the Chinese some terrible names, and they will take all that data right back to China, and they'll, they'll decrypt it, and they'll be quite upset. So 
Um, and some of it, you just can't. A, a good, ending, a, a fun story about Oki, there's a camera that uh, the rumor is it's owned by the Chinese government. Nobody knows, but uh, this is private news network. There is a big camera on a building that stares right down at our Patriots um, parking lot, basically. And we figured out they were trying to look into the back of our vehicle. So we turned the vehicles around. <laughs> a couple of weeks later, camera popped up on the other side. <laughs> turned the vehicles around again, and it's just a game. We're always doing it. Okay. I mean, generally speaking, if we go back to Russia, um, my, my kind of layman's understanding is that because the Russian doctrine, fighting doctrine over the previous decades has been more defensive in uh, in terms of how they would use their SAMs, and whereas the US would generally be more offensive, that would be why the Russians generally usually would be seen to have the upper hand when it comes to SAMs, because it fits their doctrine better. Would you agree with that being kind of on the inside, or is that just not right? I I would say that, uh, Jack, that's one of the questions we're going to get to later oh, is some of the longer, longer range systems. I, I, I agree completely. Patriot is specifically designed, now Patriot has some incredible range capabilities, but it is designed to rapidly engage and deploy at any time, anywhere. So we're, we're in defending forward assets as where Russia is designed to cover huge swaths of area in a defensive and coordinate with air assets. So those two combined, um, I would say Patriot's more defensive system. The Russians is definitely more of an offensive system. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Uh, number four. Like the Aussie, SAS were tasked to take out the Scud missile sites in Iraq. Did you know of any attempts to take out your sites by the enemy? Um, during Desert Storm and whatnot, I wasn't there for that. I, I spoke to many people. But uh, Patriot is a very valuable asset. Very, very expensive, very, very important. Its job is um, a Scud missile loaded with chemical weapons can be catastrophic to ground elements and their ability to operate. So Patriot is, it's, it's if nukes were on the table, they'd be up there. Patriot's right beneath them though. So we are well protected. Usually we are, we have our own internal security measures. We have external security measures from other forces. And I have personally never seen or heard of any kind of special forces incursion. Um, but they, they would have to get pretty deep to get to a Patriot site. Uh, mm. We've had on Okinawa, we, there's always people trying to get into munitions access area or break the fence or take pictures, but uh, no significant uh, loss of life incidents that I can think of. Mm. Okay, very good. Uh, five, can you simulate a missile launch without launching an actual, actual physical missile? And if so, can you explain basic physics behind it without obviously saying anything classified? Thank you. This is one of um, any, any kind of analysis of military engagement and doctrine uh, over the past 30 years. It's going to come down to technology is one thing. Training is another. Training, training, training. The better trained is going to be the one that comes out on top, usually. When it comes to Patriot, it carries the unique capability to do simulations within the units themselves. So we don't have to go to specialized centers and simulation equipment. We can be in the field doing live operations and simulating on things that are active in that area of engagement. So the, the, the training is outstanding. At any time, we can, okay, this is a threat. Maybe it's SCUDs. Maybe it's intercontinental ballistic missiles. We can tailor a scenario or an exercise. The officer in the unit can tailor that scenario and then just spring it. And all the interconnected parts will be playing along with it. So the capability to simulate is, is built into Patriot. And also, my experience in the military, we have simulators for everything from our rifles um, to our artillery binoculars. So it's, uh, it's, 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 it's simulation is very important to the US military and training. Okay, very good. Uh, number six, do JTACs work with rotary, rotary wing assets, i.e. Apache, Super Cobra, Super Cobra, Gazelle, and so on? So when I was doing this, I was a private and a private first class, and there is a, there's a tier of what, who's going to be allowed to talk to who, and they establish airspace deconfliction way ahead of time. We do work with rotary wing assets. For the most part, uh, the airspace deconfliction, the areas they're going to be operating in at what times are well established. And from what I've seen, they just kind of do their own thing. I have worked with a pair of Apaches in the past. They are, I was providing some, we're all on a network. You guys are kind of familiar with Link 11, mm -hmm. Link 16 mm -hmm. from DCS. So we're kind of swapping some, some target spotting information. 
I honestly couldn't keep up with the guys to give them any kind of help. There's one carving around in the canyons and one's up here spotting targets for them. And this guy just pops up and zap. And they were speaking so fast to each other on the radio. I honestly couldn't even understand it. They are incredible to watch work. And we pretty much give them the rules, the areas they can engage and just let them hunt. They're incredible. It's, it's, it's like watching predators. I mean, it makes sense though, doesn't it? Because, uh, uh the helicopter is going to be closer to the ground generally it's going to have a better eye view of what's going on so what you're saying generally is that the fixed wing assets are going to be called in to by you guys or similar to attack a target whereas the helicopters are more or less going to kind of look on their own they'll be on station and they'll be they're monitoring networks so if there's a situation where they need to be directed onto friendly assets to provide close air support or whatnot they're already on station usually we don't plan for that necessarily but rotary wing from what i've seen does have a significant amount of freedom in how they operate as where fixed wing is a to b to c drop ordnance go back to b at least with with air force Mm, interesting okay very good right uh number seven does artillery observer slash coordination come with come into the jtac job description by this i mean not only directly calling in and adjusting fire but also directly contacting artillery support to cease fire and to let air assets in or do you coordinate through a separate artillery observer so it used to be you had your guy on the ground who's with binoculars and laser designator and he would talk to a fire direction center they'd do all the calculating they'd send out the guns and the guns would know how to set up their stuff we have gone way beyond that now the computers and the designation and range finding equipment it's much better so the observer is now able to talk directly to the weapon system and the information is usually relayed digitally so we are capable don't get me wrong every soldier is capable of doing this manually the old-fashioned way but um, for the most part it's digital and what the observer will his job is not necessarily going to be so much the coordinate data so much as method of engagement and method of control. So what type of rounds, usually air burst, what your sheaf is gonna look like, how you're gonna lay the rounds out on the land, and bracketing, which is where you wanna put one round in front, one round in back, and you wanna fill the space in between with lead. Um, so really the observer's job is to uh, to rein it in, but he does, he does have direct access to calling the rounds and knows when they're gonna come. For example, the guns will say shot over, respond shot over splash is when the round impacts and rounds complete is when the artillery is done sending rounds so the observer can then walk, observe the effects and adjust fire as necessary if you ever want to look into this stuff um, it is the six elements of a call for fire and the 18 subsequent corrections and i'm sure you can find something on google and that is the uh the holy bible of every fester out there that's how we do everything from mortars up to naval gunfire it's going to be six elements call fire aging subsequent corrections when you were when you were in the field doing that then the actual medium of how you were getting the information to wherever it was going is it was it old school like on the radio giving commands or you did you have some kind of futuristic ipad going ding 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 target data sent it's it's a variety of things no Many of the radios in the United States Army and everywhere around the world are capable of not just voice, but also data use. So that's one method. Um, also, there are Link 11, Link 16, even the precursors to Link 11, Link 16 have the, data, have the ability to broadcast data. And uh, that's how we can send, especially with coordinate data. Sometimes it can be very simple, it's a series of numbers. So it's very simple. You would connect something, we'll say, to a radio, and it would just send it right over the radio just like you would the voice transmission Mm. interesting okay very good right uh question eight is there a difference between two acronyms jtac and fac uh joint oh god i can't do them there's a forward air controllers and joint tactical airspace controllers airspace controllers right is there a difference between those two and what is it um i have read somewhere that jtacs are more multinational whereas FAC is U.S. service specified, but could be wrong. Hmm. I would say that the forward air controllers are the multinational guys, and the JTACs are the... As a JTAC, I was taught everything that I knew from forward air controllers in the Air Force. And the only reason I had any experience with tornadoes, for example, was a joint exercise that went on up there 
and Colorado, the tornadoes were at the Air Force Academy for whatever reason, with some F-16s. And as a little private, I came out, had no idea we were going to call in that day, and F-16s come on station, it's kind of cool, but then the tornadoes come, and we didn't talk to tornadoes. We provided a little bit of spotting, target recognition for them, but the FACs were the guys talking directly to the tornadoes. Um, they're the guys that are trained up with all the NATO dudes. We're there as JTACs to, if necessary, where there are no FACs, that's where JTACs are going to fill that void. Roger. Okay. Uh, number nine. The Patriot missile system was branded the wonder weapon of the first Gulf War for the defense of Israeli and Saudi targets. How successful were they against Scud targets? And how much have they had to be updated to cope with more modern systems? So the Patriot system is incredible, but like most things in the US military, it's awesome capabilities lay in the fact that it's going to coordinate and work in conjunction with our units. SCUDs and other ICBMs have an inherent weakness, I guess you could say. They have to come up vertical, and that's when they begin the fueling process. And this is part of balancing the missile flight. Now, be it planes, observers on the ground, satellites, whatever, we can see when those SCUDs go vertical. And that's that time when Patriot's going to get there in range, deploy and be ready to shoot that missile out of the air when it comes down. So it is incredibly effective, it, as long as we know. And even if we don't know where those scuds are, we can have Patriot dovetailing with its fan over our protected assets. So if it does pop up from somewhere that we didn't anticipate, we have the capability to so rapidly track and engage that system that um, it is, it's incredibly, incredibly capable. It, the surprise capability of scud was taken away completely from how quickly we could deploy and the large areas that we could cover. However, it, uh, it does have its limitations that we can, so many scuds could compromise it. As for keeping update with modern stuff, uh, Patriot has been an incredible system to start with. And some of the modifications I've seen is the capacity for one, Patriot Pack 3 increases the amount of launchers or the amount of missiles on the uh, launcher itself. And also some of the capabilities, modern newer pack interceptors, some of them, don't even feature a warhead. It is um, collision, kinetic, converting um, kinetic energy directly into thermal. And this allows us to achieve total kill capabilities against things like biological payloads. So Patriot is absolutely incredible. In fact, the weaknesses within Patriot in developing new systems are helping. Uh, have you ever heard of Cone of Silence? No. It is inherent to all radars, and can't look up. The radar can look right. far out, but it can't look up. So newer systems developed from Patriot, the modern versions of Patriot, have a radar that can look up, it can rotate. Right. It's this big wide thing. So Patriot is, is still top dog. Everybody wants it, and it is a growing thing. And we believe me, there have been companies trying to replace Patriot mm. for a while, and they, they no one's got anything better. Regards the uh, the kind of future base roundup we, you talked about without the warhead, how is it possible now that they that that's achievable? Is it simply now with the modern system that it can be that much more accurate that you can ensure a direct hit? Well, the like I mentioned before, the earlier interceptors we were able to put that on a pilot's face, mm. and the way that Patriot particularly engages uh, interceptors, I can't necessarily talk about where it's going to try to hit, but that capability is actually old. We just figured out, as we mentioned before, we have the typical plane coming in, Mach 3, we'll say, Patriot Interceptor coming in, Mach 3. That engagement speed is incredibly high. And if we just put you know, dense materials in there that can survive very high temperatures, the conversion of that kinetic energy to temperature creates this temperature that uh, no one's going to make an aircraft gimmick that can counter mm -hmm. that. So that was just old school I, I don't i have no idea how the engineers even came up with that system <laughs> it's, mm. it's kind of ingenious and that's but on the same time there's there's been designs that use very small explosives and tungsten carbide little shrapnel bits to pepper missiles so it's you know, there's there's all kinds of stuff coming out now it's either ramming stuff old school or micro explosions and pellets mm. and patriots incredible system and just to make sure there's no confusion about the beginning bit, we were talking about uh, a satellite or whatever would spot the uh, scuds going up for launching. 
Yes. And, and, and you guys were going to set up, you know, potentially where you think that might be a threat because it was in so many kilometers away from a, a town or something that might be the threat. So you're going to set up, you know, probably between the, or behind the town or whatever. Um, yeah. But you still, to actually engage, you've got to wait until that's fired, that's traveled over its arc. And then when it's on its way down is when you're going to presumably do the intercept. Yes, once once the missile's flying is when the, the radar is going to detect it. And that radar is no joke. It is high speed, looking around at all times, and once it thinks it sees something, it will interrogate the crap out of it. And the operators inside of the engagement control station are incredibly skilled guys. And they're working in conjunction with my former position in the battery command post. And I'm working in conjunction with everything from AWACS to Ford observers, and it's... Uh, it's very difficult to get anything by that, that total picture. Roger, do you have a rough? Is there a is there a known rough ceiling of, of that type of system, or is that not known? Major? Yeah, I never really thought I about would, it. I've always seen. I would it's, say mm. the the type of fuel we're looking at and whatnot. I mean, it's very similar to basically Patriot at the core of it is it's rocket science. So you're talking solid rocket motors. So I would imagine the theoretical ceiling. I, I joked about this back when I was in that Patriot with its kill capabilities and how little it has to carry to be effective really size is the only thing stop my thing from going out into space. Well, yeah, I was kind of thinking about that. I mean, take it with a big pinch of salt, but roughly speaking, we've clocked the older S300 series. Um, um, sorry, I've forgotten what it's called, but you know, the Russian one. Um, we've clocked that, uh, you know, to be able to engage things well over 100,000 feet, which is I mean, at some point you, you'd start in, but talking about it being in space, really, at that point. So Yes, Patriot can engage at extreme altitudes, I know that. Um, so it's just, again, it's it's dependent on the, the future of fuel, and, you know, who knows, the interceptors might get big again. Right now, it's been towards micronization. We've got smaller interceptors and more on the launcher, but that, that reverses and goes towards a bigger trend. Patriot could have a hell of a range, but mm -hmm. there's also uh, considerations like time and flight. Patriot has some engagement doctrines that determine how we act dependent on initial engagement results. So when you're talking about extreme longer ranges, longer flight times, it becomes harder to work within that doctrine. There's a huge time delay that's just not acceptable mm. in a combat environment. Yeah, okay. Right, uh, question 10. Could you please explain the different types of CAS, type 1, 2, and 3? And do you think there is a place for more realistic CAS missions in DCS using a JTAC, proper comms, and flight planning? Um, so among the different uh, close air support, I don't know the different types. I would not be able to help that at all. That's a, that was a little bit beyond me. For the DCS and the close air support missions, it's fairly accurate from what I've seen. Uh, I have two cousins that fly. They're both graduates of the Air Force Academy. I have brought up with them and a couple of pilots. And from my understanding, seeing stuff on the ground is it's it's hit or miss. You know, you can't mm -hmm. eagle eye, but you're talking about a guy running around with a bazooka. Um, in air defense, the joke with the old red eye systems was you fire it at a plane and then you get the hell out of there <laughs> because if it misses, there's an airplane looking for you now. Mm -hmm. um, Really, the, the close air support's going to be dependent on the pilot's ability to see. Um, those A-10s, those other planes, I mean, if you can see it all day long, I, I think DCS definitely has the potential, as hardware increases our ability to to pump up things like you know, shadows and whatnot to make it a little easier to spot a guy running out. I, I think the hardware is the limitation right now. Mm -hmm. That and, you know, if you want to do close air support like it's World War II, those guys were really low because they were really slow. And that's not necessarily the game now. Even when planes come in and do gun runs, those gun runs are carefully coordinated by a JTAC usually who's going to dictate exactly where he wants those shells to paint. So the pilot is not making a whole lot of decisions. Yeah, that's a fair point. Yeah. Okay, uh, number 11. How fast can you deploy a defense perimeter to secure the location that needs to be protected? Is it depending on the terrain, weather, expected op, uh, op for in the region, logistics, tactical evaluation? Is he talking about setting up Patriot here, do you think? I think so. Um, so there was uh, some operational time, time limits and things like that I can't talk about. So I had a, 
Uh, I was going to say quickly, equipment capabilities and training dictates preparations for everything ranging from occupation and operation within areas containing chemical and hazardous contamination to defense against enemy incursion or attack. Basically, um, Patriot can pack down to a bunch of trucks ready to drive down the road and set up shop 10 miles away, ready to shoot stuff. A lot quicker than most people think. I will say that. A lot quicker than most people think. And under than under an hour, for sure. Uh, and this is not just our ability to displace, to keep up with forward moving troops, for example, and protect them, but it also enables Patriots to rapidly relocate in the event that, you know, say there's a, not necessarily harm missiles that are always a threat to Sam. Sometimes somebody might just, especially North Korea, there was a big threat that a chemical payload could come in just to taint our, our launch sites. In which case, if that happens, we're able to relocate to a new, lo new location very rapidly and maintain the same defensive posture. But we can do it very quickly. Um, that's about all I can say there. Uh, I don't think there is a system with the kind of capabilities that Patriot has that can come close. In fact, that once again, when we talked about earlier, the dance between China and, and us, there is a unit in China that is specialized for deploying their cruise missiles and whatnot, and it's pretty clear in air defense that there's some racing going on between that unit and our Patriot units, and we know that we're watching each other. So <laughs> we're still quicker than they are, though. <laughs> I mean, just looking at it from the layman's point of view, if you if you look at a a, a Patriot site, you've got a what disconnects the cables that that link the the various units between the other various units. You've got to uncage the radar, lay it flat, and that's it. Put the launchers down, and you're off. I suppose there's not many. It's from again from the layman's point of view, not many physical things that have to change. They're just sitting on the wheel trucks, otherwise ready to go, aren't they? Yeah, the only thing that comes off of a truck in Patriot is the tent that I used to work in. And that, mm. We only use that if we're intending to be somewhere right. for a period of time. Other than that, yeah, we can do everything from the backs of the vehicles. And the, the cables that we have to roll up, they all have these huge reels. So we, right. we are well drilled, we disconnect them, we just crank those mm -hmm. things up. Very good. Not to mention that if, for example, the, the launchers are designed to operate wirelessly if necessary, and in the event that, say, our fire control area is contaminated, but not our launcher site, we could pack up and go somewhere else and let another unit control our stuff until we're ready to take over. Interesting. So our engagement capability is still there. We have no personnel that are technically in danger, but the weapons are still there and capable. So hmm. it's, it's, it's a lot of frustrating things about Patriot that drive people crazy. Or our opponents, I should say. So that means it can be fired kind of remotely. So you can go in and set it up, get the people out, and have it fired remotely by someone else. Most of the time, if you look at Patriot sites, you'll see the, the launchers just sitting out there. There's mm. no crew members around there. Uh, one of the reasons why is when we fire an interceptor, it's going to suck all the oxygen out of the area. Mm. Uh, we'll have a group of individuals nearby, rapid response force in case it's a problem with one of the systems. But no, those, those launchers are designed to either be plugged in or, if necessary, once again, we're talking about data use, they're designed to uh, be far away if necessary and still be capable of operating. Interesting. Very good. Okay. Uh, that was that. Next uh, on the DCS, how do you? Sorry, do you fly in DCS? And if so, if so, do you have a favorite module? So um, I'm not sure if you can see it back. Well, yes, we've spotted that. Yes, that is. Uh, that's all because of DCS. In fact, I, mm -hmm. I discovered DCS earlier in 2020. Uh, I think about August time frame, and it. Well, my girlfriend's quite upset with me. Yeah, I got <laughs> track <that>. IR, <laughs> uh, giant monitor now, the, <laughs> the Gladiator NXT. Mm. Uh, yes, I, I do play DCS. My, I fly the Su-33. I oh, love it. Okay. I am so in love with that plane of DCS. Would, I understand there's a full fidelity MiG-29 in the MiG. I don't care. The 33 is where it's at. I don't fly the 27. I don't fly the J-11. The 33. I am in love with that plane. Full fidelity, though. I uh, do have the MI-8, and that is all settings. It's great. Mm -hmm. um, I can get it up in the air, and I can land it pretty good. It's about all I can do with it right ahead, now. You're ahead of me, then. <laughs> and the, the Tiger. I have the, mm -hmm. the F-5, and that is just... I love the crap out of that plane. I'm firmly in the club of we could use better avionics. I mean, there's so many modern variants of the Tiger out there that uh, I would love to have a little bit accurate, a little more accuracy with my bombs. Mm -hmm. But um, I'm still learning the F5, uh, and I am very, very anti-Hornet. 
Oh, finally. Yeah, I tell you what, it's nice to meet someone who has a, a, a manly set of planes. An SU-33, pretty awesome in every way. Uh, F-5, which is pretty much everyone's favourite, you know, non-modern fighter. And uh, and a really hard-to-fly helicopter. In fact, I can't think of a much harder... Uh, unless you had a MiG-21 added in, there's not much more manly things to fly. It's very good. So what you don't want to be doing, by the sounds of it, is in your BOG-18, I mean F-18, staring at your screen... <laughs> <laughs> and going around in Letting circles. computers do everything. <laughs> Drives no, me nuts as well. No, yeah. it's, it, it, and I, I, the, the 33, I was noticing the other day when I activate certain systems that the switches are actually moving in the cockpit. So mm-hmm. I wonder how far the low fields are from a, a clickable cockpit. But in my perfect world, the 33 might get a full fidelity. Mm-hmm. I would love to see a even a low fidelity. Uh, MiG-31 and... Su thirty four. I'm pretty sure I'd give up on a thirty four, but especially a, a full fidelity thirty four with the twin seat capability like the fourteen mm-hmm. would be. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean that's mm-hmm. that's incredible. That and I'd like to see more polish on the thirty three's weapon systems. I the thirty three is my anti hornet. Yeah, <laughs> takes, takes off from a carrier, does air to air refueling. I theoretically can't attack ground yeah. mostly with rockets. Sort of. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they're, they're amazing. Those rockets. I, I use them. Those S twenty four. It's like dropping a Mark eighty four bomb. With at well, a thousand miles an hour, it's really is quite amazing. They could do the the twin pylon mounts mm-hmm. too yep. on two of the the mounts. That's mm-hmm. cool. And for such a giant plane, and this is the reason I like the thirty three. Um, a couple of buddies of mine, DCS, I'm able to dance with them just fine mm-hmm. at thirty three, abusing the crap out of that special mm-hmm. thrust mode for mm-hmm. taking off from the carrier. Yep. <laughs> just just abuse the shit out of that, and yep. you can you can dance with those guys all day. Yeah. No, very good. Okay. Right, we better not go any further because we're going to anger a lot of people, so we'll carry on. Uh, 13, what did the military service give you and would you do it again if uh, sorry, if you were at the beginning of your career now? So in hindsight, is it something you would have wanted to have done? Absolutely. Um, I tell, obviously, I, I left the service and I, I've done lost my damn mind. I got facial hair. And, <laughs> but the especially with what's going on with COVID and whatnot this last year, the what I've been doing is I've been perfecting my resume as playing some DCS and going to school. I'm paid to go to school, and that is because of the service in the military. And cool. Just for that, I mean, it just the way it happened for me. I was working at Jiffy Lube. I was managing the joint because I'm a big car guy too. Mm-hmm. And uh, this army recruiter comes in. I'll never forget how freaking easy he got me. He comes in and we get him his bill and everything. He says, "Hey man, what are you doing?" So um, we got your bill together here. It's a little chain. Here you go. So like, no, man, what are you doing in your life? You know, you <laughs> got some leadership potential. I, I hate that. What are you doing with your life? Oh, he had me. <laughs> and uh, it's like, you yeah, had a good shop here, man, leadership potential. And left his car and went about his way. So I was talking with this old timer out of my crew. It's like, hey, he thinks I'm going to join the army, man. Says you should. I did it, man. I got to go see Korea. I got to go do some cool stuff. Just go, man. What are you doing right now? It's like, Oh, fuck, I'm not doing anything. So, yeah, I joined up just because I'm bored. <laughs> and now I've got my college education paid for. Uh, had some great stories. Got to see Japan. Um, I would I would definitely do it again. Uh, I recommend to a lot of my younger friends in college that uh, if you're bored, if you're not doing anything, just go sign up. It, I do say, though, if ego. You, know, you don't have to do the Call of Duty loan stuff up. That was the whole reason I did JTAC at first. Mm-hmm. Do what you're interested in. The army will find something cool out there, especially all the drone stuff and went now. Nah, I can work on radars if that's what you're into. But uh, yeah, I, I recommend that do it again. Roger. Yeah, I mean, of all, what, 50 people have interviewed, not one person said, I don't mean they're not saying anything negative, but not one person has not recommended it, if you know what I mean. Everyone's been happy to recommend it. Yes, yeah, it was it was a, a good experience. Mm-hmm. Uh, the next one is a fantasy one, but it's actually quite interesting. If there was a furball, so let's say, uh, you know, a friendly fighter and a hostile fighter, roughly in the space where you can shoot in the fan of your uh, uh, patriot in the skies above where you're still allowed to engage, how big of a risk is it to, uh, to friendly units? Sorry, I'm going to just read it from scratch. I cocked up there. If oh, there, no, I, uh, another question. If there is a furball in the skies above you, uh, above, are you still allowed to engage targets and how big is the risk to friendly units that are in the air? Right, so he's saying if there's a you know a dogfight or planes near each other, is there a risk that the missile can, like an Amram loves to do, if you're me, uh, go for the wrong guy with your system? Of course, your system, you know what I mean? An Amram? Yeah! The wrong guy. 
the, the Amrams t- just they, they will just turn on their own radar an Amram and it will go for the wrong guy that's not how that works in real life well, that's not how that works at all <laughs> okay but that's how it works in the game it drives me nuts <laughs> Yeah, Honor, Amram should have their they have their own tracking software. They should have their own IFF. I guess well, it's just not that. modeled in in yeah, anything. Yeah, uh, I would imagine. Um, so this this is going to come down to a couple different things. I actually talked to a couple of buddies of mine that are still serving, and to see if there's any example of an emergency use scenario where this has ever even been talked mm-hmm, about. Mm-hmm. Uh, apparently, back in the '90s, people talked about it. But our collective opinion, uh, there is nowhere in our operational manual that says that we are to engage while there's a furball going on or there's other engagement. The army is, everybody's in the military. It's real big about not sending ordnance in where people are. The other side of that, in a worst case scenario and life is at stake and we have the ability to stop the loss of life and we're the only way, I do believe that Patriot has the accuracy to throw missiles into that engagement. The problem would be, obviously, if a air, friendly airframe came in the flight path, but the capabilities of the radar to direct the missiles onto its targets and the fact that we can use um, kinetic kill weapons like the Pac-3 system, which doesn't even warhead, I'm very capable that it's possible. However, we're going back to doctrine stuff here. The Russian planes have systems in place to, to block FOD damage from their um, engine intakes, and I will tell you first down that if you look at an American turbine wrong, it's going to fall out of the damn sky. <laughs> so, um, the debris would cause a significant problem for friendly air force. Yeah, that's a good point. That's one thing we never think about it in game as well. You can blow a guy right up next to you, more or less, and you'll be you fly through the debris crowd, cr- uh, crowd cloud. Never going to be a problem but in real this life. Is very, yeah, uh, this, this is a very interesting thing about uh, people don't realize. Russia only has one carrier. But every single one of their combat aircraft is designed to take off from a crappy field and not suck up the dust while it's at it. So what do you need an aircraft carrier for if you can take off from a grass field anywhere in the world? Mm. They're, it's very interesting how they do their doctrines. Because I've done, working on Kadena, if you're anything other than Air Force, you will do a fog block if you're stationed with the Air Force. Right. They love to use other people. And I tell you what, it's once I saw Russian planes taken off from dirt strips, I was incredibly impressed because... Mm. You have not seen ridiculous until you see a pilot tearing guys up on the ground. He's got these three pebbles in his mm-hmm. hand, and he's, how am I going to kick my airplane out of the air? And you're like, are you kidding me right now, dude? Like, you walked the wrong way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's weird that that's one thing about how, in some ways, you know, blue and red have matched each other so almost perfectly but in but in that way they've gone their completely opposite ways i've never understood yes. why it's not like there's any obvious reason for it they've just one's gone one way one's gone the other way and no one wants to change so yep and yeah these uh, the american planes are incredible performance incredible weapon systems but the the russians how they utilize their systems their doctrine uh, it fascinates me gotcha. and, you know, it's like the fact they don't clean stuff the <laughs> Coming from U.S. military experience, dog and pony is one thing we do like crazy. Everything's got to be clean when the cameras are around. But Russians just don't care. Yeah, it. well, it's designed to work. Other than that, they don't care. The last, even an air show, the last react was the biggest air show in England. Uh, we went to you, all the U.S. planes were beautifully laid out, laid out the fifteen to sixteen, the eighteen, and whatever else is there clean really well good and then on the end they had the ukrainian flanker and it don't you know they made an effort and they it was roughly blue color and stuff like that yeah. but if you the interesting thing is if you go to the back of the airplane uh, the uh, american ones were still perfect everything's perfectly smooth the back of the russian aircraft you can see nuts and bolts and rust uh, an aircraft that's more or less the same age and and it's it's almost like it doesn't need to look good there, so they didn't bother making it look good there. And that was just something we've never seen before in a modern fighter, having it look imperfect. And they don't just like, fine, whatever, normal. Yeah, I got a great example of this. Uh, a non-commissioned officer who will name nameless, but served in Bravo Battery 11ADA. Um, we, we had a static display and show off our radar for this thing and some photo op. So we wanted it to look as good as possible, so we were cleaning it. And this guy came up with a wonderful idea. Now, mind you, we're about to drive this thing on Japanese roads. Mm-hmm. Um, he sprayed the whole radar trailer down with CLP, 
which is the lubrication oil that we use for our rifles, okay. the whole radar trailer was covered in oil so that it would be shiny and look good. Mm -hmm. I, that could just ask any, yeah just it would just cover any high-end electrical system with oil uh, <laughs> penetrating oil at that and just mm -hmm. see how it works in three weeks <laughs> oh dear that could be expensive yeah okay right very good right we got a bit off track there um 15 when you were stationed in japan did you notice them doing things a different way to the u.s military and what if so this was uh, this was eye-opening experience from working with a Japanese self-defense force. So, a lot of similarities between the radar, the interceptors, and whatnot. But the trucks they mounted on, the way they do their stuff, is totally different. Uh, their operational doctrine is totally different as well, and it was fascinating to see. For example, you could be 300 meters from a Patriot site, you know it's there. You got these giant generators, they're like 12 cylinders, and they're supercharged. We have two of them running at the time. Not to mention all the generators powering everything else. And the fact that we're driving big old Oshkosh, four axle trucks, and LMTDs, the seeping oil all over the place. You can, you can follow Patriot with a, an EPA crew. <laughs> <laughs> but the Japanese are using commercially available, obviously ruggedized, um, commercial tractor trucks like freight trucks. And they've got powered front axles, so four wheel drive. And their generators are basically off-the-shelf Honda units that have been militarized and they're quiet. So 50, 50 meters away from the Japanese Patriot side, you couldn't hear it. It was incredible to see that. Now, granted, it had very little off-road or all-terrain capability, and their radar also wasn't mobile like ours was. But, um, yes, there's a number of things they do different. And it's, uh, it's fascinating to see. And the, their, their dedication, uh, we have a question later about a story, and uh, I'll, I'll get into that later. But they do things different, and they're very, very competitive. They're fun. <laughs> okay, very good. 16, are the close-range SAM systems still relevant considering the advancement in stealth and performance of the potential op forces around the globe? Absolutely, more than ever. The Sentinel system I spoke of earlier is a towed radar. So you have a Humvee generator in it, and you got the radar. And you drive that out with the crew, and you're going to set that radar spinning around. It's going to give you a small air picture. You combine that with others, and you're going to have a bunch of small radar bubbles that are going to be inside of a big radar fan for something like Patriot. Now, these systems are incredibly important now. The reason why is things like the cruise missiles. They have the capability to get down in the terrain and even low-flying aircraft. Stealth aircraft, uh, stealth capabilities at low altitude and high speed are debatable. Radars can see things that people think they can't, and you can send missiles after things that people think that you can't. But these smaller radars allow us to see things that think they're going to use penetration against us. So if it's cruising in a canyon and there's a signal down there, we're going to see it. And that's why they're important, is we're going to fill the holes in the terrain with those portable systems. And they are interconnected with our big ones, so everybody knows once somebody comes in. Hmm, interesting. Okay. Uh, question 17. Are all the SAM systems manned or can they be operated remotely from a safe distance? We've kind of covered that. If so, how can you protect against jamming the signal or someone taking over the controls? So jamming radar is, uh, well, that's interesting. Um, it really goes the other way. Radar tends to jam anything else around it, especially Patriot. Patriot is one strong-ass radar. <laughs> um, it, it messes with anything wireless. It's in its way. But... Um, as for safely operated, as mentioned earlier, the launchers for Patriot, simply because of the nature of sending rockets in the air, you can't have people near them. They're, they're going to be sort of remotely operated. Um, as for things like Sentinel Radar, this is a fun, fun thing. It's, it has a remote operating cable that is like 200 meters long. So you set the radar spinning and you run this cable out to a little trench you dug. And it's got a little screen that shows your air picture and you operate it from there. The reason why is because it's a Sentinel radar, and radar anti-radiation missiles don't give a shit. <laughs> they just go after stuff. They mm -hmm. will pit bull on something like nobody's business, and you will never see it coming. And uh, 200 meters is about the casualty radius of a good anti-radiation missile. So okay. you run this cable outside of the casualty radius. So if your radar blows up, you can at least drive your truck back and go, uh, sorry, just the radar got blown up. We're alive. <laughs> More jump. I was just looking at the Sentinel 
um, in the background there. Interesting. So you want to see something fun about the Sentinel. If you uh, take a length of 550 cord and you tie it on one side with a red glow stick and tie the other side with a blue one, it spins and you get a little portable rave party. <laughs> well, that's, <laughs> that's a bonus and you get that for free. So Yep. These things the instructors don't want. To know. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Uh, right, okay. Can you guide us through an average day, if there is such a thing, of a forward observer officer when deployed? Uh, no idea about the officers. Yeah, I, I don't know why I said that. <laughs> <laughs> well, they, well, actually, a day in the life of the officer is putting up with the pranks that we put on them mm-hmm. all day long. But it, it, it's highly dependent. So fisters, that's, that's what we call fisters. Um, forward observers are small teams that on a battalion level are going to sit at like headquarters level and then come closer to deployments. You're going to task out for individual units. Your day is completely dependent on what your parent unit is. So you can be tasked out to armor. That was one of my favorite times to be alive because they don't get out of their tanks. So we didn't have to set up stupid tents. None of that crap. We just drove places and slept in the vehicles. Um, infantry though, light infantry. So it's the worst day of your life. <laughs> Back when I did light infantry, they were, our commander read this book about long range recon patrols during Vietnam where these guys would go 15 clicks out and then 15 back. So we started doing that. And it's <laughs> when you're, when you're light infantry, you got some guy up top, like, hey, let's go walk 50. Cause on infantry minutes, one thing, but as a fister, we got to carry all of their load. And with our little three man team, we now got to split up our, our extra radios, our batteries, our tripod, our designators and carry aircraft. <laughs> so, Infantry sucks. So <laughs> your day is really dependent on where you're at. Fair enough. Okay. Um, can you explain? You mentioned Excalibur rounds. Can you explain a what they are and b what would in your job you do differently based on that? Excalibur rounds were the answer to the very high cost of precision guided weaponry. From what I was saying, uh, airdrop precision guided weaponry. This was a way to take our um, not old, but uh, yeah, 155 artillery systems and convert them into precision weapons. So this was a, is a round that can use, you know, just like uh, precision weapons, GPS or laser guiding, but it's an artillery round, parabolic trajectory. The Excalibur round extends its range through uh, cap on the back of it. The cap comes off and deploys its little wings and it can glide out and engage targets and also can kind of come down on stuff which gave us some, some additional capabilities. And it was meant to kind of deter the cost of precision gun weaponry. When Excalibur first came out, it was two or $300,000 a round. Now it costs about about the same as throwing a 3 years BMW down range. It's about the same cost now. Mm-hmm. And uh, another fun story, they realized they had to move guns that were firing Excalibur to the front of fobs because this cap weighs about 13 pounds on the back of the gun mm-hmm, or on the mm-hmm. back of the shell and when it came mm-hmm. off right out of the cannon it was clocking guys and <laughs> 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 to move the cannons up but yeah it's, it's basically just a precision artillery round and there's some crazy artillery rounds out there ones with rockets on them and you could have um different warheads in them is that right i'm just kind of yes uh same thing with the precision systems there you can have uh one that punches through the ceiling knocks all the floors out of the building but leaves structure standing they have bunker busting variants they have uh, anti-personnel air bursting it's a uh, a modern munition system for us roger i mean the interesting thing about these is ignoring like low collateral damage which is obviously a plus but isn't it right to say that to hit something with normal uh, unguided rounds you would need to fire lots of them Whereas you could only need to fire one of these uh, to, to, you know, 100% kill the target. Um, that was one of the reasons. Uh, another reason was it gave the Army, outside of rotary aircraft, precision capabilities. And within the artillery sphere, we're taking systems that we couldn't really use. I mean, we have fair, we, we can get very accurate with artillery cannons, but in insurgent style conflicts, we just, we're never using the dang things. So this gave us the capability to, especially in an urban scenario, like I said, blow the floors out of something. Mm-hmm. You can leave the building standing, but take out occupants inside of it. And that was very, very important because otherwise the Army was left waiting for rotary assets, which can have long downtimes. Um, it might not be on station for you or be dependent on the Air Force, as where now 
uh, these battery guns will be active, ready to go anytime forces are in the field, so capable of engaging with precision. Okay, very good. Very interesting. Uh, question 20. I don't think this is relevant, but let's see what you think. How difficult was uh, to work on with the Tornado compared to the F-16? Uh, it wasn't, like I said, I, I never saw tornadoes on the ground. I was this little private there that was uh, that was there that day and worked with it a little bit. But I, I, I will tell you this, so I wouldn't say it was uh, the rareness of it. But we've, we've seen American aircraft all over the place. When the tornadoes came on scene, they owned the show. <laughs> like that was everybody, what is that? Like at first we thought they were Tomcats. Uh, and then we single single tail up there. What the hell is it? And then... <laughs> They, they're some cheeky guys. That's that's you could tell there was a chip on those pilots' shoulders. Mm -hmm. Like they Correct. they came hot, proving mm -hmm. something. The, the F 16s came out and they real quickly turned into a pissing contest. Mm -hmm. And this one tornado, this whole town built up and blowing stuff up. This guy dips his wing right the wingtip right between these buildings. Mm -hmm. I, I just could not believe it. And then these F 16s started getting so low, they're kicking rocks up, they mm -hmm. barrel roll off of gun runs. And it was. It was awesome to watch, but the tornadoes started it. <laughs> they, they weren't taking any shit. It was great to watch. That's awesome. Okay. Uh, next, back to the Sentinel. What is the Sentinel portable defense system, and when is it used? If you do, you want to go over that again, or the the Sentinel? Okay, so we've already been over it. It's a portable system, uh, tellable by Humvee. One of the cool things about the Sentinel is you can com now pair it up with another aging system that that increases effectiveness, and that's the Avenger which uh, I think is stingers that it fires. I think so, yeah. But yeah. it's also got a um, 50 cal or two 50 cals in there that is, I believe it's also radar yep. guided. So it can light you up and combined with the Sentinel. Now the Sentinel can see a bit farther than the Avenger can. And the Avenger, I believe, can just plug directly into the Sentinel. So that if an aircraft is detected, the Sentinel will just right on the target. Roger. Isn't it interesting that you can get these kind of modular radars that you can just almost plug and play? into legacy systems it's uh well there's there's a lot of benefit for that for the for the manufacturers of the systems uh, especially with patriot for example there was patriot's very expensive there's a lot of people hating it on for a while but once we showed the, the data link capabilities the inter interoperability of the payloads the cost was rapidly available it, there's just no room anymore for a system that can't grow it's true in aircraft, especially. You know, uh, we saw how F5 Tigers grew throughout their lifetime, even into the, the Tiger Shark and its capabilities. Same thing with Patriot stuff and, and these radar systems. Yeah, the Avengers we didn't give up on them necessarily. But they were regula reg regulated over to National Guard use. But now that we discover that we can plug them together, yeah, it's these aging systems. And that's mm -hmm. the key in, in United States right. military doctrine is that interoperability mm. in, our, in our capabilities. Okay. Uh, 22. What were the security briefs about the J-24 to evalu evaluate the jet's performance or develop a strategy against them in the future? So this was uh, at the time I had gotten clearance to uh, attend security briefings from the Air Force. And this was uh, during a time that I called the Korean Missile Crisis. Kim Jong-un was launching stuff at the time. And as Patriot, we were very busy. So one of the briefings I was at was very interesting. They showed this, and I'm going to go ahead and talk about it because the obviously the plane's flying now, and at the time, nobody had seen it. Mm. And sitting in this black and white photograph, which is also kind of odd because we have we have cape. We couldn't have couldn't afford couldn't afford a uh, color printer, obviously. Yeah, we're we're very capable. So, but this this black and white photograph uh, down it looked like an, an F-22 at first, mm. and. We had had some interesting things in Patriot that I wouldn't say are ex unexplainable, spurious contacts or things on the radar screen that could be a flock of birds, could not be. They're very common. They happen almost every single ship. But there were some that you could theorize might be perceived as some kind of probing behavior. And uh, they put up this, this image of this plane and boom, the questions came in. Uh, they didn't know what it was. They didn't know what capabilities were. I mentioned specifically that I was a patron and seeing a number of spurious contact returns. And uh, if we had any idea of the relative size of the airframe so that I could relay that to my radar operators. And uh, they couldn't answer that. They couldn't answer whether it was internal, external payload, touch speed capabilities. They didn't even know if it was manned at the time. They, they thought it was a possibility it could be uh, unmanned. And the only reason I 
drew a parallel as a, a buddy from DCS was talking about the, mm-hmm. the plane as it now. And he showed me a picture of it. I said, Hey, that's, I saw that thing when they were testing it. And back then it didn't have the canard surfaces mm-hmm. forward of the wings. It was pretty much a 22 club, but that was uh, yeah. Back in the day, there is, I will say the, the air force's response to it was kind of cavalier, but also Kadena is the home of the largest uh, combat squadron of F-22s in the world. So in addition to the Marine, Japanese, uh, and Army Patriot units there, they're really much to worry about. Roger, how long ago was that roughly? I'm trying to tr- place this in history. Cause this ten is years quite, ago. Oh, ten years ago, wow. Because this thing's... Right, okay, fine. Wow, so that must have been before many people really knew about this then. Exactly. We, we were... There was actually a lot of thought, too, that... Because uh, there's also the, the size of it. Mm-hmm. We, we know that it looked like a 22 club. Mm-hmm. It was big. Mm-hmm. The, the photograph said it was a big damn girl. Mm-hmm. And there were so many questions at the time whether it was even real or whether or not it was specifically out there just mm-hmm. to throw us mm-hmm. off. Because at the time, the Chinese were doing very creative things with their missiles and how they were deploying them. And we figured this might have been a way to redirect our attention. But uh, apparently it is a full aircraft and uh, it's something. Mm-hmm. Very interesting. Okay. Right, um, where are we now? Stand by. Uh, 23. How big is the effect on the SAM's capabilities, the surrounding uh, terrain, and the climate? How does that affect the SAM's capabilities? Not at all. <laughs> um, really, no, not at all, really. I mean, if it's like a typhoon, it's, it's, it's <laughs> hazardous <laughs> to equipment, but obviously we, we, we do pack up for those. I've done that a number of times. But, I mean, you could have the worst rain in the world that radar is going to see right through it and the interceptors are moving with such velocity that the the weather conditions aren't going to affect it at all we've actually had on one of our sites during a uh, live fire exercise there was some some questionable site planning and we we put some missile right through some trees mm-hmm. didn't have a problem <laughs> did, right out the launcher mm-hmm. right through a damn tree and it didn't even it didn't slow mm-hmm. it down so uh no there it's all weather capable system it's not it's not shy. In fact, uh, a bigger version of Patriot could be considered Cobra Dane. And Cobra Dane is out in, I think it's Shumia, Alaska. It's one of the most inhospitable places in the damn world. And it's, it works pretty good. <laughs> Roger. Again, just a, a layman's question again. I'm, one of my projects this quarter is to investigate whether radars have trouble seeing through cloud moisture and stuff like that. Do you know if that's a thing and if you had, to, if Patriot didn't, not struggled, but Patriot had to account for that or compensate for that? So I will put it this way. Um, if you look at modern radars, a lot of them have uh, little octagons all over the radar okay. face there. Mm. So the radar is capable of, and this, this is most phased array radars, uh, they're capable of using all of those octagons at one time to look at the big picture. But if they suddenly decide that they see something worth looking at a little harder, the entire power of that radar system can be applied to a space the size of one of those octagons. Hmm. So it had to be an incredible cloud. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> uh, once, once Patriot begins, or any phased array high-end radar begins interrogating or looking at something, it's going from this very wide view, and it's still going to maintain a passive surveillance mm-hmm. but it's now taken that immense power of that radar and it started focusing on a very small area to to get a better picture of what has suddenly got its attention and mm-hmm. uh yeah once it starts interrogating like that oh believe me there's a lot of power looking at mm-hmm. you do not stand in that beam no in fact you can uh when patriots active you can put your hand up and you'll feel it oh god right okay i'm not gonna do that <laughs> i wouldn't recommend it, it tastes like copper oh good lord <laughs> Okay, very good. Um, why is the US not investing in longer range systems to match the S-400 and the upcoming S-500 complexes, in your opinion? So, again, we've uh, we went over the whole range thing. So, mm. my opinion, the S system's range potential is incredible. However, Patriot's range potential is uh, underreported, and um, it's, it's incredible as well. So, the S system's Russia's a gigantic landmass. Um, they're going to have to hold cat. They're going to have to find a way to protect that giant landmass. And um, as we're patriot, you know our range limitations 
are offset by our capability to move forward and rapidly deploy. So again, I think the S series is also, uh, it seems to be a one hit wonder. It's designed to send a missile up and definitively knock the threat out of the air. Patriot is designed to, you know, we're okay with missiles. We got tons coming more, uh, coming your way. And if that fails, we got additional launchers. Um, again, I think the S systems are meant to be working in conjunction with air forces and even the S systems, extreme range capabilities I've questioned about their actual capability of engagement or whether that is somewhat to put aircraft on the defensive. Mm -hmm. If you know, you've got a flight of 27s coming at them and you can put those airplanes into a defensive posture and reduce their speed damn near 60%, you're putting your 27s in a much better position to engage. Yeah, that's very interesting, isn't it? I've always always questioned the, the. Uh, I mean, people like to compare uh, the range of things. Uh, my SAM can fire three times as far as your SAM. That doesn't in any way make it more effective or actually mean it can kill stuff, um, like you're saying there. And as soon as you're out to those massive ranges, actually having a to be able to track that target constantly and not have it notch your radar or go behind a hill or something, uh, it almost seems like a waste to me. <laughs> but, it's like the beyond visual capabilities of things like F-18s and F-15s. Right. Those radars are incredible. But to effectively, now granted, their their autonomous controls can be better all the time, but to effectively position that radar to get the most range out of it, a combat pilot might be capable, probably is capable, but it's just much easier to utilize systems from like an AWACS and hand targeting mm -hmm. and off to that than to ask the pilot to do um, all these things. Russia, is, I don't know if you noticed, but the KA-50 used to have one person, now it has two. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the 34 now has two people. They're coming to realize yeah. the, the value of that extra crew member because mm -hmm. you're asking a lot. Okay, 25. How difficult is to differ between military equipment in the air and civil aviation, drones, etc.? Have you ever had problems to identifying a potential threat? No. Uh, in the JTAC world, part of it was every single week, it's a 17-week course, every single week is a failout test. And every single week, part of the failout test is these blacked out silhouettes of airframes mm -hmm. from all over the world. So you got to you know, nail the airframes, C-27, F-15, what have you. So you get your visual. And then with our radars, why not we have identify friend or foe? Okay. And they're going to be squawking. So that's not ever really a problem. If we don't see it, if it's not telling us what it is, because even commercial planes are uh, have codes they squawk, uh, we pretty much know right away there's shenanigans afoot. There was a, uh, a close canter that I heard of that we knew was a civilian. It was a good buddy of mine in the air defense school. He was a deck controller, uh, aircraft carrier. And it was somewhat after 9-11, there was an airliner that was squawking hijack off uh, the western coast of the United States coming in. And he, he scrambled 18s up to meet the plane because they couldn't get radio contact. And uh, the F-18s made visual contact. The There was still no radio response. So the 18s dropped back into an engagement posture and they got a uh, call back mm -hmm. on the radio finally. And obviously a pilot knew when the 18s were dropping back that something was up and he, he got on the damn radio. Mm -hmm. But that, that really spooked him because he, he told me, he's like, you know, I was about 10 seconds away from ordering that airliner mm -hmm. out of the air. Uh, because it was post 9-11, it was too much of a risk, and he's like, I, that, that was, we were ready to go, we were hot, we're about, we're less than a minute from putting that plane out there. And that's, that's the, the user error is the problem in identifying it anymore. Our systems are incredibly capable, so usually it's down to user error. Andrew, okay. Um, is flying extremely low, but still having line of sight technically, uh, able to keep an uh, aircraft safe from the SAM network. So flying, I don't know, you know, very low, 50 feet off the ground, but not behind a hill as such, enough to keep the aircraft safe, or it, would it still be trackable? Yes and no. There are, uh, obviously there's, uh, trackable, sure. You know, detection, you might not evade detection. Engagement, you might avoid for a while. But um, we're probably going to see that you're there, if that's what you're avoiding. But as for... Keeping the airplane safe, my example is Patriot. Patriot can look down to treetop level. And if you're an aircraft, sorry, my cat is quite, quite attention fiend. But uh, if you're an aircraft, getting below that's going to be extremely difficult. However, most 
ordnance systems, long flight systems, unless they're specifically programmed for it, like cruise missiles, are going to have some sort of low trajectory setting, which means they're going to fly so low before they self detonate So you might be low enough that people aren't going to want to engage you or will have trouble engaging you, mm-hmm. but um, it won't keep you safe. You know, you might, uh, most likely you'll be picked up at some point. You might disappear, but we know to be looking for you. But speed low altitude can be a defense. In fact, we're kind of seeing an inversion from World War II days to now, to where getting low and getting slow is more effective than, than getting high and fast because the radars looking up are incredible nowadays. Mm-hmm. We have, we're putting blimps in the air like it's World War I again. <laughs> um, the new version uh, Patriots uh, replacement uses blimps to, 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 to look basically down over the horizon, which we couldn't do before. Wow. <laughs> so yeah, so so low altitude stuff is getting even more difficult. <laughs> mm, okay. Uh, how did you choose to go towards your military career? You've already given a story, but anything you want to add to that? Uh, for air defense, I I done the Fister thing and I, I I got hurt and I had to change my MOS after I spent about a year getting operations done and whatnot. And I chose air defense primarily because I, they were going to Japan. In the army, it's almost impossible to get Japan. So I chose air defense to go there. Mm. But coming into it, I didn't realize what a large world. This is my cat. Apparently, he wants to say hi. Hello, cat. Hello. Um, so air defense is a very small world. And also, you might have heard of Space Force recently. Mm-hmm. We already had that. It's called Space Command. And that's that's air defense. That's an order. Um, so once I found out about that, that was something I really wanted to get involved with. And it was it was pretty cool to see all that. The, the Ford Observer stuff, okay, honestly, the Ford Observer thing, the reason I chose that was because I had seen Transformers a couple mm. of times, <laughs> and the part where that C-130 is on station, Inspector Gunship, yeah. bring the rain! Yeah. Oh, that was cool. that was all over the place. And then I went to JTAC school, and my Ford Air Controller said, if you ever say bring the rain on the radio, mm. I will turn your ass inside mm. out. <laughs> oh, <Funny. laughs> I was waiting my whole life for this. <laughs> Okay. Um, is it a big challenge to keep an air defense system operational and is it hard to maintain? I don't know how you're going to answer that without spending three hours, but any, any kind of way to respond to that? Can be, yes. Uh, the, the biggest problem is that radars are very delicate pieces of electronic equipment. And we did this one test that's painful where we hook a truck up to the trailer and it's called a jerk test. And you literally hook it up to the trailer and then you mash the throttle on the tractor and yank it to make sure that the trailer's connected. Boy, our chief warrant officers and even our defense contractors are like, oh God. <laughs> and yeah, just, just singular chips. We're talking like the size of a RAM stick on a home mm-hmm. computer, upwards $10,000 on that right now. A- so, it is some pretty cool stuff though. Uh, we'll tell you, there was one time we had a cooling issue on the radar and I was freaking out and my, my warrant officer comes out basically cooling for a car. Mm-hmm. I said, like, what the hell is that? It's, like, it's cooling for the radar, man, we could use this. So all the electronics are dead. What are we going to do? It's, it's got a hand pump in there. I mean, if it, the, the Patriot Raider is a pretty rugged piece of equipment, but they can be. It is far and away the hardest system I have ever had to maintain um, just because of it, it's complicated. Uh, we have a, a sheet of paper that's for every piece of equipment that we sign out every week. My truck alone, you have 550 pieces of equipment mm, that I have to keep track of. Just my truck. So it's... It's the equipment, it's the radios, and uh, one of the hardest problems with those radios and stuff is this heat. It's the, the, they are, oh man, they get hot. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes, it's very, very complicated. Very, 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 very complicated systems. And it's another reason to get into the military too, because if uh, you're one of a 1% of the United States that's ever even looked at the inside of a Patriot radar, Raytheon's probably got a good job <laughs> for you. <laughs> Okay, excellent. I get the feeling you could probably talk all day about that, but it was good. It was good. Um, uh, going back a bit, what were the tornadoes tasked with at the time when you saw them or worked with them briefly? Uh, that was what we were doing was it was a demonstration of joint air, uh, joint close air support and the capabilities to do it. And the tornadoes, we started off doing just regular, um, they weren't very large, I and mean, maybe one. Hundreds, two fifties, maybe. Drop bombs, little Connex village, and then it turned into gun runs to show the capabilities between the British aircraft and the American craft, both with uh, guns and bombs that we were capable of that drop of a hat, putting eagle off. And I will say that uh, Tornado is a huge plane in comparison to the F sixteen, and didn't have any problem. 
<laughs> that they can get down on the deck to where you know people oh my god and then it's <laughs> out of there no problem okay last question here can you share with us an interesting story from your service that you will remember for life i had a commander that i did not care for mm -hmm. nobody really cared for him and he didn't know his job very well so i <clears throat> We were having communication problems on Futenma, which is an installation on Okinawa, and we couldn't get communications with our headquarters. So I was very frustrated because I knew what the problem was. I knew how to solve it. He wasn't very receptive. So my first sergeant was not on site, which is the only reason I got away with this, with my skin. So we had this antenna called Noe 254. On top of the antenna, there's a whole bunch of whip antennas that stick out all over the place. Basically, if you take the tip off, it kind of looks like the COVID germ. You know? <laughs> and uh, I ratchet strapped this COVID germ onto the top of my commander's Humvee <laughs> and convinced him to drive around Futenma in the middle of the night saying, can you hear me now? Which if you <laughs> know anything about Verizon advertising, that's where that came from. And uh, basically just to get rid of him and see how long I could get a commander in the United <laughs> States Army to drive around with this contraption on the top of his Humvee on a marine installation saying, can you hear me now? He was gone for about three hours, <laughs> and I started to really worry. <laughs> so he comes driving back, <laughs> and there is Marine Security Forces escorting his Humvee. And I, at this point, I'm contemplating the end of my career. <laughs> I was like, well, it was a good run. We had lots of jokes, but this one went too far. <laughs> These Marines are not happy at all. And he comes storming into the tent. Here's my, here's my dad. It's like, here it is. And he's grinning ear to ear. Great. I got a signal. <laughs> well, that's great, sir. Where did you get a signal? At which point the Marine pipes in and the commander had taken his home. He was driving all over Fatima saying, can you hear me now? When he finally got a return. So he parked his Humvee directly adjacent to an active runway. <laughs> At which point security forces had to come out and tell him he had to move, at which point he wouldn't leave because <laughs> he had radio communication and was trying to get in touch with me back at the back at the site. Good and Lord. uh yeah, there was uh so they had to bring in the second car to convince him to go or be arrested. And uh yeah, the, the Marines lost a airstrip for a couple hours. <laughs> <laughs> and my commander just whoosh, he never got the joke. And <laughs> The people around me in the command tent, when he came back, were just, they were like, God, just, did Raider get away with this? There's, there's no way Raider skates on this one. <laughs> and yeah, my, my first start never found out about it. And uh, it's, it's pretty legendary. <laughs> that is quite lucky you got, got away with that one, actually. <laughs> okay, I'll end of those questions. Have you got five minutes just so, so I can ask the stream if they've got any follow ups? Sure. Okay, stream. I know you're a little bit behind, but. Um, based on what we've been talking about, um, or, or the synopsis, anything you guys want to add? Just give them a second to to wake up from their slumber. Because I have the best. Yeah, I also have ADD, so I can, I can I can talk about this stuff for days. So it's good. It means I can sit and relax. Well, a bit. DCS is a great outlet for that stuff. Holy <laughs> crap! <laughs> yeah. yeah. Has targeting for the Patriot become significantly improved so that it can accurately pick out? The warheads versus the trash. I don't quite get that. What does it mean, the warheads versus the trash? This has been a... Uh, hmm, it's an interesting question, you. The, basically, the way we engage warheads or missiles in general is extremely important. Uh, this is one of the reasons why Pac-3 and Pac-4 were developed to begin with, is that intercontinental ballistic missiles are going to put their payloads on the tip on the warhead. This is for balance issues, and the missile's going to rotate. So what Patriot wants to do is it wants to hit on that warhead. There's many reasons why this can happen, but we also have different packs for different means of engagement. So we can target the motor if we want, we can target uh, different parts, or we can target the warhead. And that was part of the tests back if you look at the Raytheon footage, we can put it on the face of mm -hmm. an individual, is that we're able to engage different missiles for specific reasons. You know, if it's a nuclear payload, we don't want to hit that warhead. With that warhead. If it's mm. chemical, we don't want to hit that warhead. So we're going to try to chop the missile in half and then maybe go pick up the warhead. How interesting. So if you've got a threat, a big missile coming over, and you've somehow identified what it is, I don't see how you'd ever manage to do that, but let's say you knew, you could decide how and where to strike that missile. Nope. That would be down to which which interceptor you're sending up there, and it's mm -hmm. going to make its own determination. 
on how it's going to engage. Mm -hmm. So, and that would be, you know, if you, and, and this is all information that is figured out way ahead of time mm -hmm. and it's loaded into the, the missiles, the systems engaged, they all have a database of different types of mm -hmm. threats and it's going to say, okay, this is this type of threat, so I will engage accordingly. Does it figure it out from its own, from the radar scanning it? Does it figure it out what it is? Or? That that helps. Uh, the mm. radar can give us a basic look of what the mm. shape is and the size of it, mm. the length of it, and that gives us a lot of indicators uh, right. of what type of missile it is. Gotcha. Awesome. Okay, guys, anything else from the stream? Have you dealt with radar spoofing? I'm sorry, I'm going to have to be stupid again. What's that? Uh, spoofing, I believe, is where it's it's attempt to jam us, but also where you can throw out. Basically, we're going to take. A, we have this nice, pretty track that we're locked onto, and now it's 70 miles away, and now 150 miles away, and now 80 miles away, and that's called spurious tracks. We can get that on things that the radar can't fully resolve, like a flight of birds. Um, I haven't seen any systems that are capable of doing that, um, and one of the reasons why. Mm, very high-end phased array radars aren't going to be spooked by that is their big view might you might interrupt that because you're putting anti-radiation stuff like chaff for example between the radar and the plane but when we take all that power and put a new very mm. small area and look at you mm. very intensely it's going to cut right through that mm. or to find a space between those little bits and that will look through that mm -hmm. so it's, mm -hmm. again, it's very capable radar system interesting okay guys um that was great that was a, that was a really easy one for me because you're a good talker it's always difficult well, when, they, when they're not a good talker because i have to kind of spur them on but this i could just sit the back and almost be a kind of i don't know customer listener or whatever so it's really good fun and the interesting thing is we covered so many different things we covered we covered the sams we covered the jtax we covered the fac and we covered all kinds of even miscellaneous stuff which i uh, it's just enjoyable for me to, to sit and just listen and shut up for once. So uh, I enjoyed that. Um, I was quite nervous, but this was fun. No, you did really, really well. I'm chuffed with that, and I'm really glad that we brought you on now. Uh, as we shut down, obviously, thank you very much for coming and giving your time and taking the time to do it. You know, anyone that's out there that thinks they could, well, just you know, entertain slash educate, please, you know, don't, don't, don't feel any way you shouldn't do. Come and let me know. Um, anything you want to say before we sign off? I guess. Uh, no, other than, you know, the, the DCS guys, stay with it. It's a great community. I'm, I'm a guy that never played a multiplayer game in my life. Uh, I, I hated them. Didn't like, didn't like the online game. And uh, came into DCS, and now I'm a member of multiple squadrons. Mm -hmm. I'm getting on servers. Like, you know, yes, yeah, just keep doing your thing. DCS community is great. The Grim Reapers are great. Love the content. You guys just keep being you, and... More good things are going to come. Thank you very much. Right. Well, um, take off in your sea flanker and go and do, shoot down some hornets. Uh, is what you need to do. <laughs> thanks very much. I'm signing off. And thanks and see you later. Thank you. Right. You guys have a great one. Bye. Bye-bye.